Genevieve and Mark, I can help uh, monitor the chat and then just direct people to the q and I can like, thank you for a question here, but please use that Q&A function. Okay, so I can, and I can, I can do the same as well. Okay, yeah, yeah whenever we Thanks see more people much. popping up, yeah. Sounds good. So I'll keep my eyes just on the Q&A then. Yeah, that'll be good. Thank yeah. you. And Carmen might be just a couple minutes after 11. Sorry, hope we can start just a couple minutes after. Yes, and I'm fine. sorry, just quickly again, you're going to mm -hmm. feed me questions, private message, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's it. I'll be it. looking for frequently asked questions and themes right. throughout. Right, so. okay, great. Cool. All righty, well. Are you, are you ready? I'm ready. You ready? Okay, I'll, I'll start letting them in then. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, everybody is just getting logged on right now. I see uh, everybody signing on. So welcome um, this morning. Happy Friday to you. It's been an amazing <laughs> week. Um, certainly been full of excitement this week. Um, anyway, we are very, very honored to have uh, Assessor Carmen Chu here this morning, and she'll be joining us in just a moment. But <clears throat> I'm going to give a couple of minutes for everybody to get uh, logged in. So hang tight and we'll be right with you. Good time to have a sip of your coffee or whatever your beverage of choice is this morning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think Assessor Chu is on, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so let me do a little bit of little introduction and then um, we will turn it over to Assessor Yay! Chu. But uh, as I said, today's speaker is San Francisco's elected assessor, Carmen Chu. Um, assessor Chu has served as our city's assessor since 2013. And since the COVID-19 pandemic crisis began, she's also served as the co-chair for San Francisco's Economic Recovery Task Force. Um, it was also announced last week that she has been nominated by Mayor London Breed to serve as San Francisco's next city uh, administrator. For today's presentation, we'll ask her to keep her assessor hat on and while she shares with us information about working with the assessor's office during COVID and what our membership needs to know about Prop 19, which is the property tax portability measure. Um, please, everybody welcome Assessor Carmen Chu. Good morning, morning Assessor Chu. Hi. That's how are you? Good. How are you, Mark? It's so nice to see you. It's been good so to long. See. I know. I have to say the the COVID the COVID pandemic has definitely been tough. We have been able to see people in person. So I, know. I think that I think it was about a year ago when I saw you last, actually. <laughs> you can believe that. Um, I know. First of all, I want to congratulate you on your nomination. Thank We're you. We're very, very excited for you. And just you know that um, we've always you you have always been a good friend to uh, SFAR, and we've always been supportive of you, and we continue to be supportive of you and we're very excited for you so thank you thank you mark and thank you for your support and also for sfar support i think through the years we've learned a lot from you especially in my role as assessor and i hope that um, in a at least in the last seven eight years you've been able to see a, a dramatic improvement and change in how we do business and so hopefully you've been able to see that and i'll cover a little bit about that but i know that many folks are probably wondering about the changes in the new state laws and so i'll cover spend most of the time covering that great but but you you have done an amazing job as as uh, our assessor and we're so grateful so i just want to make sure i get that out before uh, <laughs> I, get to, I don't get to see you probably for another who knows how long so i i know we hope that it's not too long from now though <laughs> hopefully anyway i'm going to turn it over to you i know you have a presentation and 
by the way, folks, at the end, um, we'll, we'll have a few minutes for question and answer. If you have a question for Assessor Chu, please put it in the Q&A box, okay? If you don't know where that is, it's at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, to the far right, there's a Q&A button. If you uh, click on that, you'll be able to see that. So um, we're trying to keep all the questions in the Q&A so it's a little bit easier to manage. Anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Assessor Chu. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, so. Of course, everybody, I wanted to say good morning. I hope that you've had uh, so far a, a great year. And of course, um, it's been an exciting week also, lots of changes um, amiss. Um, but I did want to spend some time with you today to kind of go over some of the work of our office and then also to cover again, Prop 19 and some of the changes associated with that. Um, I just want you to know that I have a number of folks from my team who have also joined in on this, um, uh, this call so that if you're typing in some of the questions in the chat functions, or if I refer to different links or different resources along the way, they'll also be kind of populating that chat uh, uh, scrolling uh, script so that you'll actually have access to some of that as well. And then just for you to know, we plan to be sharing with you the presentation today. So um, don't worry about trying to feel like you have to you know, quickly jot down the information. We'll share it with you um, so that it can be distributed to um, you know, to, to you and to other folks that you think might be interested in this topic. So with that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. <clears throat> Can you see that? Awesome. Yes, yes. Thank you. So we'll just get started. Um, uh, as you know, as Mark mentioned, uh, I serve as San Francisco's assessor, uh, but uh, I will be going through a confirmation process at the Board of Supervisors to become the city's uh, city administrator. and. Um, there is not yet any information in terms of who the mayor plans to appoint into the assessor role. And so um, should I be successful um, being con confirmed? And so just to know that that's information that's uh, to be forthcoming uh, that you'll probably hear pro directly from the mayor's office or others uh, about that. Um, but that being said, being able to kind of share with you this information with my assessor's hat on is my honor. And so first and foremost, I of course have to just share with you the disclaimer, legal disclaimer. The information we provide with you, provide to you today really is just meant to be informational and hopefully gets you information to be able to think more broadly about uh, the impacts of Prop 19, but also helps to set you and provide some useful tips for you going forward. Um, of course, we can't provide legal advice. We definitely suggest that if there's any uh, person here or people that you know who want to make a change, that they do seek legal um, or accounting or financial or other advice before doing so, because there are many impacts. And so, uh, as you know, my role uh, has been since 2013, the assessor of the city and county of San Francisco. It is an elected position with one assessor in every county. Uh, the beauty of, of that is that in every single county, uh, in California, we all operate under the same property tax laws. And so most of the laws and rules that we have to administer and to follow are actually uh, provided to us by either state board of equalization or laws that have been passed by the statewide voters or by legislators uh, at the Capitol. Um, there is one portion of our work that is regulated locally and that primarily has to do with transfer taxes. And so transfer taxes are uh, regulated by local transfer tax laws. I think when I first became assessor, some of the things I really focused on and really wanted to do was to really help turn around the organization and create um, the model assessor's office in the state of California. And that is always a work that needs to be in progress, something that we need, should, need to and continue to strive to be. Um, but that being said, many of the things that we have focused on really have centered around how do we create more standardization so that people have um, equity and fairness when it comes to taxation. We want to make sure that anybody who comes into our office have the same level of service and the ability to access information, data, uh, and be treated e equitably and respectfully. We care a lot about making sure that we modernize both our business practices, but also the tools that we have. And I know SFAR has gone through a lot of that with new tools that have come online for your organization as well. Um, and of course, we care a lot about making sure that we cleaned out the backlog. For a very long time in San Francisco, I want to say over two decades, San Francisco has operated with a perpetual backlog. And that really isn't the way that we should be operating 
uh, our work, we really should try to get assessments done as quickly as possible so taxpayers know what to expect. But not only that, um, there's not a risk to the city uh, should we be able to not collect when uh, folks move on. Here's a, some just kind of high level um, information for you, how we close the role, as well as some of the technology innovations that we've made. I think it's worth just touching on so that you are also aware of some of the changes that have, the really the, she, the sea changes that have happened in the last several years. Um, in terms of technology innovations, uh, as you know, we have rolled out, we did roll out electronic recording many, many years ago. And that has continued to be a big uh, benefit and a great help for people who are wanting to just have a more convenient way of recording and getting uh, information to our office. Right now, close to 70%, or well, before the pandemic, close to 70% of recordings came through the electronic portal. And recently we were able to expand the, the types of individuals or people who could electronically uh, record with us. So now it's expanded the universe, for example, in addition to title companies, to lawyers and a few other uh, types of professions. Um, all of those individuals have to continue to um, have agreements with the city and county of San Francisco and have the security protocols that are necessary to make sure that whatever they submit continues to be safe and secure. Um, the other big thing that we did was that we actually got rid of all of our paper files in the city. We actually had, or in our office, we had you know, 200,000 plus uh, properties with about 3 million images that were all in paper files. It was, a, it was often the case that you couldn't find those files or that it was sitting on someone else's desk. Uh, we actually turned all of that into electronic system that is a centralized database for all of our pivotal and most important property information. Uh, this has been really a big improvement and it was actually what enabled us to continue working remotely because we're able to access all of that information at our fingertips on desktops, on our laptops, remote and on site. And so we're really glad that we made that improvement and it couldn't have come sooner, especially since we've had to remote work uh, through the pandemic. Uh, you're aware also that we have just recently launched a new recorder system. Uh, we did this in August of this year and actually coming up in March of this year, we're planning to roll out phase two of our new recorder system. It's going to add additional functionality uh, for individuals. So a few things that we hope to be able to do just so you can, can understand what will be coming down the pipeline. Right now, if people want to get a copy of, let's just say, an official uh, public marriage certificate. They have to either come in person, submit it by mail, or they have to go through a service called Vital Check, where they pay a premium in order to get a copy of their records. Well, when we launch phase two, we're actually going to remove the need for that middleman. You can actually go directly to our website and request information and have to pay a lot less than what you had to before. So we really are continuing to make improvements in that area and hope that that's a good benefit to people going forward. And then finally, the big, big project that we're currently working on, and it's never easy, these system projects are never easy, but we've had a legacy computer system since the 1980s. It's on a cobalt-based programming um, system that is no longer taught before. And I think you probably have heard me say before that we've been working very hard to figure out how we get off of that system into a platform that can be maintained for the long haul for the city and county. And so I'm really happy to announce that this month that we're going to be launching phase one of the property tax system. So it's been a long time in coming. Um, that's gonna be released this, this month and there's gonna be a phase two that's going to be even bigger. But that being said, I think we're heading in the right direction when it comes to where our technology infrastructure is going. A few big kind of by the, by the role numbers that you should know, our total assessment role is roughly $300 billion. It increased about 7% uh, compared to the previous year. Um, and it represents about $3 billion in revenues for San Francisco. We also collected roughly $300 million in transfer tax revenues uh, last year. Uh, we have seen a slight reduction in terms of transfer tax revenue that has come into the city. However, the drop in the number of sales, it's been, it's been in the last few months, it's kind of come back up. So it's, we're gonna be interested to see kind of how that goes. I think what that's really telling us is that while we're seeing generally a slight kind of slowdown in the marketplace, what we're really seeing a slowdown in is large commercial properties that have high value because those are what really drive the transfer tax revenues that come into the city. Um, and then we also have seen single family sales drop a second year in a row. And so 
this is just interesting statistics for you to kind of be thinking about. We're going to continue to track that information. Right now, median sales prices have increased to $1.32 million in San Francisco, and we'll continue to track that information as we go. So moving forward to Prop 19. So this is this should be a proposition that is somewhat familiar to, to you. I think this is a measure that was, as you know, originally put on the ballot by the California Realtors Association. And what happened is that they ended up uh, going a different direction. So they ended up submitting it through a um, through the legislature. So it became a constitutional amendment that was submitted through the legislature. And that initial ballot measure was actually pulled off of the ballot. So, you know, so there's there was an original ballot measure that that qualified. That one got pulled off because it was substituted by a um, legislative, um, a Sacramento legislative body's constitutional amendment that went in. So a few things happened very quickly. It passed in November uh, 2020. As you know, it passed by maybe about 400,000 votes or so. Um, the election was certified not that long after on December 11th. So that's when it when the Secretary of State formally made um, the announcement that that ballot measure had indeed passed. Um, there are really two effective pieces to the legislation, one that is effective February 16 and another that is effective April 1st. Prop 19 is a constitutional amendment. And so um, the one thing I will just say is that I share that timeline with you because it passed in November, um, it was certified in December. It go, one part of it goes into effect in February. So there's not a whole lot of time. And unfortunately, what that has meant is that there are a number of pieces to the legislation or pieces of the law that is unclear or not said in the actual ballot language. So in all those instances where the legislation is silent or there is a gap, um, we're actually going to have to go back to either the Board of Equalization or to the state legislature to get clarity on how to apply the law. So unfortunately, I think with anything that is kind of put together, you might just be missing different pieces of it. They don't spell out all of the details about how it should apply. And so now assessors across the state are really working hard with the um, association, the state associations to kind of figure out how do we get clarity in order for us to more equally apply the law across the state of California. The unfortunate thing is that April 16th, it's coming up really quickly and there's nothing in sight, right? There's no new law that's in sight that kind of helps create that clarity. The BOE hasn't yet provided formal kind of um, uh, information just yet. And so we're still waiting for some of that to come through. So I think as most folks know, um, in order to understand what Prop 19 does, it's important to understand basically what Prop 13 does first, right? And so just remember that we tax you. So the assessed value is often based on your the fair market value at the time that you purchase your property or you became the, the new owner. Um, this is really an important concept because the assessed value can differ from the market value, right? And so the way the tax law works is that if I became an owner of a property, we would take a look at what the fair market value was at the time of when you acquired the property. That would become your assessed value. And every year thereafter under Prop 13, your assessed value or your taxable value, we kind of use, I kind of use that word, um, that phrase synonymously, it can't go up by more than 2% a year or the California CPI, whichever is lower. So that's the way Prop 13 uh, works. There are instances in which you would reassess it to market value. And that typically is when a new owner comes in, right? So someone new becomes an owner of that property or buys it from you, or if, uh, new construction happens. So a very, um, very common occurrence that people might add square footage, right? They might add a new room, they might add a new bathroom. In that instance, we would be adding the new, the value of what changed. So many people kind of confuse and say, do I reassess the entire property in that situation? We don't. We would actually just reassess uh, to market value what has changed. So if you added a new bedroom, we would add the market value of what the bedroom square footage would mean for your property onto your existing Prop 13 value. So this is the, um, what currently exists. So there's two parts to the law. Um, one part of the law deals with the transfer or the ability to keep your Prop 13 value. So again, the Prop 13 value is different. The taxable value is different from your market value. 
over time, if you've owned a property for a long time, that actually becomes a very valuable tax savings uh, for you because you will be taxed at a much lower rate than what your market value of your home would be. There are current laws in place that allow for you to pass on that Prop 13 value, that lower Prop 13 value uh, to your children or grandchildren. So parent to, to child transfers or grandparent to grandchildren transfers. But there's also a program that is available that allows for seniors to be able to uh, carry on their base year value to a replacement property. Under the current law, this is how it works. Uh, you'd have to be an individual who is 55 years or older or disabled. Uh, and of course, uh, the disabled, how, what, what is defined by disabled is also defined in the state law. Uh, you're able to transfer your base value within your same county typically, um, but there are limited exceptions where some counties accept it from other counties as well. Um, it has to be that the replacement property is equal, uh, as, is of a equal or a lower value than the original property. And this, you can only access this benefit, you can only access one time in your life. Under the new law, this changes pretty significantly. It would be an expansion of benefits for seniors. And so what happens is that again, the new laws continues to have 55 plus uh, severely disabled individuals will also qualify. But not only that, victims of wildfire and natural disaster also would qualify. So they've expanded who could el be eligible for transferring their Prop 13 base year value. Number two, uh, remember when I said before that it usually is within your own county or in few exceptions for counties that do accept uh, a county, other county transfers. The law under Prop 19 would just simply erase all of those kind of restrictions and say, anywhere in the state of California, you can purchase a replacement property. So I don't need to check to see if Alameda County accepts the base year value. I don't need to check if San Francisco does. Universally across all counties, the replacement residence can be, can be located. On the third area, uh, it used to be that you were restricted to be able to benefit this for the, from this program only if the replacement property was of equal or lesser value. Now there isn't any limit on the value. However, there is a calculation essentially that basically says if you have, you know, we, they'll let you ca carry on the amount that you had from your Prop 13 plus the incremental increase. And then the other piece of it finally is that in the past, you were only able to benefit from this program one time in your lifetime. You're able to use this program three times in a lifetime now. So, you know, the April 1st um, program, I'm less kind of concerned about really sharing with folks because this is more of an expansion of benefits as opposed to a restriction of benefits. Uh, so we have a few um, scenarios here. We have uh, just to kind of walk you through what this could look like. You know, a homeowner is, who meets the condition is 55 years or, or, or and older, uh, sells their primary residence for a million dollars. At the time of the sale, their assessed value, however, was uh, $500,000. They buy a replacement property for 900,000. In this situation, you know, they meet the criteria. We're gonna assume that they didn't, ha they haven't exhausted the three times in a lifetime um, situation. And we would basically be taxing this person for the replacement property at $500,000 instead of the 900,000. So even though they have purchased a new property worth 900,000, we're still going to tax them at the $500,000 level. So this is another situation where you have um, the same situation, 55 years and older, primary residence is a million, their assessed value is 500,000, but they buy a replacement home that is more expensive than the primary residence market value. So in this case, it's 1.2 million. How would we do the calculation in this case? Well, we would take the difference of the market value of the replacement property compared to their existing home. So in this case, we take 1.2 million minus 1 million and we get a difference of 200,000. We would add the difference to their current existing assessed value, which is 500,000. So 200 plus 500,000 and you get 700,000. So in this situation for that new property that is worth $1.2 million in market value, we would tax that senior at $700,000 versus 1.2 million. So it still increases, but it doesn't increase as much as it could have. Okay. So now the other piece of the law that's going to, into effect very quickly that actually has been more cause of heartache than anything. Uh, we've seen a lot of people who have asked questions about this. And just for people to know, 
Um, in many instances, people may have set up trusts or they may have set up something called or recorded something like called a transfer on death deed. Um, both of those instruments help people to avoid a costly and perhaps lengthy probate process when it comes to passing on property after they pass away. However, it doesn't prevent necessarily this law from applying to them. So I think this is what this is a question that I've been getting a lot from people. They've said, hey, I set up a, a revocable trust. Will this law apply to me? Well, because you actually haven't transferred property in a revocable trust, it just sets up what you plan to do in the future. Um, in effect, basically, whenever the property changes hand, if it's in the future, past April, uh, past uh, uh, February 16, the new law would apply. So I think this is just one thing to kind of think about is that the change in Prop 19 will throw a wrench in people's planning if they have already set up certain trusts or certain TODDs with the expectation of tax savings in the future. It may not be the case, and they just need to evaluate that. So a few things. Under the existing Prop 58 program, which is what we typically call the parent-child exclusion, uh, it was passed in 1986. Here are kind of the, the general principles of how that program currently works. Um, for your principal residence, you can transfer that property to your child um, and keep the Prop 13 value regardless of the value of that property, so long as it's your principal residence. So if I'm transferring a property that's worth $1 million to my to my child in the marketplace, or I'm transferring a $20 million property, I can pass on the entire Prop 13 value to my child if they were to, if I were to give it to them at this point in time. The second big element of it is that there's no restriction on how your child would use that property after they inherit it. So they don't have to live there. They can actually keep the property, rent it out, or they could choose to live there, or they can leave it vacant. There's no sort of restrictions on how you can use the property after. You can still benefit from this property. Uh, uh, Prop 58 uh, benefit. The last piece is that in addition to your principal residence, you're also able to transfer up to $1 million in assessed value. So not market value, $1 million of assessed value of any other property type. So it could be a rental property. It could be a commercial, a commercial rental property as well. Uh, that would fall under this category. And just remember that the million dollars applies to, it's a, it's a dollar value that, that goes with the parent for each parent. So if it's a, a couple that is trying to pass on property to their children, they collectively can pass on to two, uh, pass on $2 million in assessed value. So how does the new law uh, change? So as of February 16th, new, a new, condition, new conditions would apply. So here are the big changes that you can see in red. Uh, for your principal residence, whereas before there was no kind of upper limit on the value, uh, right now there actually would be. There is actually a value, the current taxable value plus $1 million is, is the upper limit. Um, the second piece is that in the past there was no restriction on how you used it. Now, in order for you to benefit from passing on the Prop 13 value to your child, you actually not only have had to have had that property be your primary residence, but it also has to become your child's primary residence as well. So that's a big change. So if they were to inherit it, but decide that you know they already had another house somewhere else that they were living, uh, they wouldn't be able to benefit from uh, Prop 13, uh, Prop 13 uh, value being passed along. And then finally, for any other property that is not a principal residence, they would no longer be able to pass on the Prop 13 value. So rental properties, commercial rental properties, none of those properties would be eligible for you to pass on the lower potentially Prop 13 values to your children. And just know with Prop 58, the transfer can be from parent to child or child to parent, either direction. So let me just walk you through a few scenarios about how that would work and how we would calculate that. So let us just say that at the time uh, of transfer, the assessed value, so the taxable value of a parent's primary residence was 1.5 million. And let's just say that that same property, its market value though was 1.8 million. If the property transfers hands and the child meets the condition, meaning that they actually live in that property as their primary residence, this is how we would do the calculation. We would take the assessed value, which is um, in this case 1.5 million. We would add $1 million to that. So there's an equation and it becomes 2.5 million. We compare 2.5 million to its market value of 1.8. 
since the 2.5 million is higher than the market value, there is no change in the assessed value that is able to pass on. So in this case, the child inherits the property, even though the property is worth $1.8 million in the marketplace, they're able to carry on $1.8 million uh, as a property tax basis, like the taxable rate essentially. So no change there. They're able to get the full benefit uh, of this program. Here's a second situation. Let's just say it's the same property, but the market value is different. Let's just say the market value of that same home is 3 million. So this is an instance where let's just say someone bought the property a long time ago, and now the market value is far, far exceeds kind of what the principal, you know, what the taxable value is. Um, this is not unusual. Uh, in San Francisco. Let's just say the transfer happens, the child moves into the property as their primary residence. Here's how we would run through this scenario. So it's similar to the other one. We would take the assessed value and add a million dollars. So it's that same 2.5 million you saw earlier. We compare it to the $3 million in market value, except that in, in, in this instance, it's higher than that 2.5, right? So 3 million is higher than that 2.5. So what we would do now is we would take the difference between that those numbers, which is 500,000, and we would have to add that to the existing assessed value to derive what your new assessed value would be. So in this case, we take that 500,000, add it to the 1.5. And so now the person, the child, will be paying taxes at a level of $2 million versus the parent was pa paying taxes at 1.5 million. However, the child still gets a benefit because they're not being taxed at 3 million. Right? So in this case, they do get a benefit. It's just that it's a partial benefit. The next two scenarios are fast. So I'll go through them quickly. So this is a situation where it's the same property, but the child doesn't move into the property as a primary residence. In this case, no, no benefit um, is given to the child. So that property would have to be reassessed to the full market value at $3 million. In the next scenario, in this case, the parent is passing on not a primary residence, but a rental property. And in this case, because it's a rental property, doesn't get to pass along the property's Prop 13 value to the child. So they'll be taxed at the market value, in this case, of $3 million. So many people, uh, whether it's yourself or your family or maybe even your clients, are probably thinking, well, gee, do I try to transfer my property now before February 16th so that my children are able to benefit from an ongoing property tax kind of lower basis, right? And I, I would just say that there are a lot of things to consider before you make that decision. Here are a few big ones that we wanna make sure you're thinking about. Um, one is that there are many other financial tax impacts that are above and beyond property taxes, right? So I'm just talking about the property tax and how it would apply. But remember, there are other things like federal inheritance or gift taxes that you might want to be thinking about. You might also want to think about what the intended future purpose will be. Will your child sell the property uh, in the future, for example? Because if they do, maybe it's better off to leave it as is so that uh, for capital gains purposes, they get a step up in basis as opposed to um, inheriting kind of your basis if they were to receive it as a gift right now. So there are other financial impacts that you're going to want to consider if you are thinking about transferring a property now versus kind of just letting it pass on when you pass away. Um, the second thing is that for many people, you may not wanna think the worst of people, but you just have to know that if you end up passing on your property to someone, even if it's your child and someone you love and you trust right now, you ultimately are giving up your property rights. And so what that means is that you may not have the right to live in that property, right? You may not have the right to borrow against that property, to pull equity from that property. Essentially, you are no longer the owner. And so it's really important that people understand because we see a lot of parents sometimes who say, well, I want to do this for my kids, but then they end up giving up the entire property rights to, to what they own. And in some instances, especially for seniors who had planned to live there until they pass away, um, you know, you, you just have to consider that because it may not be the wishes of your child once they inherit it or once they get it. So it's just something to, to really think about. Um, the other two things we want to make sure that you know is that definitely go seek professional help because they'll be able to walk through your unique situation with you. And that's really important for you to understand all of the different angles of your consideration. These questions about what you do, should you do it now, should you do it later? It's never perfect. There's never one thing that is all beneficial and one that's all negative. And so I think you just need to understand the consequences. And then finally, we really do um, hope that you won't wait to the last minute because 
even just trying to kind of get these conversations going, getting the help that you need will take time, much less we want you to make sure that if you need to record a document with our office in order to effectuate this, that you have enough time for that to happen. There are instances in which we reject documents. We reject them because they're incomplete sometimes or sometimes a improper or not enough recording fees were submitted. And in that case, when we return it to you, it gets mailed back to you. You might not get it in time to resubmit before that deadline. So we just wanna make sure you know, don't wait till the last minute and really try to uh, encourage other people you know who are thinking about it to, to start working on this now. Okay, so again, many, many unanswered questions to Prop 19 um, that I'm sure we have a lot of questions that will come through the, the chat about this. And so um, I'll wait to answer some of those there, but just to know that uh, the Board of Equalization has set up um, uh, informational uh, information essentially on their website to talk about the future of Prop 19 and how it gets implemented. Again, we're still waiting for them to give us further guidance on what that looks like. And for our office, um, again, I just wanna make sure that we tell you, I share with you kind of what, um, what you need to know about our operations during COVID. So even during COVID-19, we continue to operate and be open remotely. We do have very minimal staff who are on-site to process paperwork that comes through so that we receive things continually on, an, on a timely basis and we're able to process things on a timely basis. Um, but that being said, I think a lot of people are questioning, like, how do we get to you if City Hall isn't open? Uh, even though we're not open for general kind of drop-ins, there are a few ways in which you can um, access our services. So of course you can continue to mail documents to us, electronic recording, and also we have set up a Dropbox uh, on the Grove Street entrance of City Hall. So that's another way to get a hold of us. The best way to reach us, of course, is uh, you can call 311 and they can connect you directly. They also track your question. And so we're able to kind of see from a system point of view what kind of outstanding customer service requests we have outstanding from them. So 311 is a good way to reach us as well. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but and it's definitely not a very fancy looking Dropbox situation, <laughs> but, but it will do. Uh, it, it serves its purpose. The one thing I would say is that um, I mentioned that recording fees are a big deal because we could potentially reject documents if we don't receive um, the right amount of recording fees. So there really are on our website, on our public website, we actually have a fee schedule that shows kind of what you should be remitting depending on what it is you're submitting to our office. It's not very, sometimes if you're not in the business, it might be less clear about what, you, what that means and which ones apply to you. So if that's the case, a few things you can do. You can call our office or email us and say specifically what you're recording and we can try to give you an estimate. The other thing, if you feel comfortable with it, is that many people will write a check to the city and county of San Francisco for the recording fees and you would note that it's for recording fees and you put a not to exceed amount. So like if you feel comfortable saying, I don't exactly know, I think that my fees will range somewhere from $75 to $200. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but I feel comfortable writing leaving the check blank, but saying not to exceed $200 or something like that, our office can fill it in once we calculate what your, your amount is. So that's another option for you if you feel comfortable doing that. And then just a reminder that um, this goes into effect February 16th, it's a Tuesday, but Monday is a legal holiday. So you're gonna wanna take it, that into account. And then I think that is it. So this is our, um, uh, contact information, assessor at sfgov.org. So also if you have questions, if you don't wanna call 311, you can also send an email here. It goes directly to our public service desk. Um, we also set up a website that is specific to Prop 19, which is sfassessor.org forward slash Prop 19. So feel free to go to that site. You're gonna see videos from a previous webinar we did, as well as other information and related forms that you most likely have to fill out. Uh, so. Thank you for that. I'm going to stop sharing and start going into questions because I'm sure there will be many of them. Thank you so, so much, Assessor Chu. We really, really appreciate it. And this is, there's so much information that you presented to us, which is great. Um, a, a couple of, just a quick answer to a question, if this is being recorded and will it be available to our members, it will be. Um, so uh, Genevieve will um, post that onto our site when it's available. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, and uh, your staff, by the way, thank you to your staff. They've been wonderful and they've been answering questions in the Q&A as well. 
Um, but a couple of questions that have come up uh, that, that you haven't answered or it wasn't covered. Um, one is um, if a child moves into uh, the property after the effective date of Prop 19, how long does he or she have to live in it to keep it from being reassessed under Prop 19? Yeah, it's a super question. Um, we've received this a lot. So a few things have to be true um, for you to be able to so let's just say that Prop 19 has, has kicked in. So we're past February 16th. Under the new law, there's a few things that we do know based on the ballot language. The first is that it has to have been your primary residence, number one, right? And so you, you as the parent will have had, um, for example, a homeowner's exemption that was filed on that property to designate and to make and to prove that that was indeed your primary residence. So that's one thing that, that you want to make sure that you um, have as a, a checked off. Uh, piece. The second thing is, as, as the um, writer uh, mentioned, the child moves in because it is their, becomes their primary residence when they inherit the property. They have up to one year to file a homeowner's exemption to prove that they are actually in effect kind of a, um, the, that that is their primary residence, essentially. The law is currently silent as to what happens afterwards. So, you know, how long do you have to live there for you to get this benefit? Or what, what if I move out, do, does that benefit then go backwards and you don't get the benefit any longer? So the law doesn't say it's not clear on any of that. So when we talk about kind of the, the pieces that are still unclear, though, that is one big piece of it. So we think though, assessors think though, that based on the intent of the law and how people characterized it when they were trying to pass the ballot and when the legislators spoke about it, that they intended this benefit to exist so long as the person who inherited is actually using it as their primary residence. So it could very be very well be likely that the state is going to interpret it to say, so long as you live there, you get this benefit. But once you move out and decide you want to rent it out, or you know, if you want to do something different to it, and you're no longer a, one of the child, the child who inherited, for example. We think at that time that we probably would have to revert back to the Prop 13 value as if you didn't receive that benefit. So yeah. that is still unknown. We could get direction from the state that says differently, but we think that's probably how they might interpret it. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. It, it makes sense from the intent, I think. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so another question. What if I add my child to title assuming 50% ownership before the change takes place on uh, February 16th, would that protect them from an increase in taxes and property taxes? Uh, only for their 50% 50, 50 Okay. Right, so think about it this way. Um, if you, there are many different ways to hold title. As, as you're aware, it could be tenants in common, it could be joint tenancy, for example, and they have different kinds of survivorship rights, different, um, issues relating to debts and creditors and so on. So you're gonna to wanna to really like get the legal advice to understand. I'm not sure if it's just me guys, or I think we may have lost uh, Assessor Chu. So sit tight for a second, everybody. You know, technical difficulties, not atypical for Zoom meetings. Um, Jen? I'm here. Okay, this is, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't just me. No, it looks uh, like we <laughs> lost her for a bit. Um, okay. I assume she's trying to log back on. Yeah, it looks like she's, she's logging back in. Okay, great. Sorry, everybody. 
Just give us a second here. Looks like we're still having a little issue. But as I mentioned before, um, this is gonna be recorded and I believe that um, uh, Assessor Chu's staff let us know that the slide deck would be available as well. So not only will this be recorded, but um, we'll have access to the slide deck, I believe, um, so that that can be shared as well. So yeah, some great information here. Um, and uh, again, I wanna thank um, Assessor Chu's staff for answering all of the questions that are um, in the Q&A. A lot of them, uh, a lot of them the Assessor did answer during her presentation, but they're uh, answering them in the Q&A as well. So thank you guys for that. And I believe, Hi guys, there I'm back. You are. On. There you are. <laughs> trying to figure out a way to see if I can call in. <laughs> I was welcome back. But just picking off where I left off, if yeah. so your your 50% is yours because you are the owner already, the child, right? However, when the parent passes away, their 50%, when we have to apply the law, we would have to apply the law that takes that is uh, uh, effective as of that time. So then essentially what that would mean potentially is that that 50% of the parents transfer would be based on the new Prop 19 laws. Cool. Okay, yeah. great. So another uh, question related to partial ownership. Yeah. Um, if mom sells her primary residence after April 1st and buys a home with an adult child, can she port her tax basis to 50% of the new home? Wow. So let me see. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a. So I think, so I think a few, that is interesting. I think a few things would have to happen. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud right now. I'll yeah. probably have to follow up to make sure I got this right. To benefit from the senior um, transfer, right? So this is the April 1 transfer. You can still benefit from it right now, but let's just say that um, you're buying a house that's more expensive and you want it to, you want the new rules to apply so that it's more expensive. Sure. You probably have a situation where the parent would end up buying the property and then um, they would benefit from the low Prop 13 value. So they have carried on essentially their property tax basis, mm -hmm. in which case then they would try to add title to the individual. So the child. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the new Prop 19 laws would have to be in effect because by April 1st, the February 16th date is already in effect. And so so long as that child continues to live in it as their primary residence, that would they would be able to continue to benefit from the passage of that 50% over to them. That, that makes logical sense, so yeah. Um, okay, cool. Uh, here's a question that's a bit off topic, but a good one. Um, given the current uh, economy and negative impacts for commercial property owners, is your office considering now Prop 8 information for the upcoming 2021-22 role, particularly hotels and retailers suffering now in COVID. Yeah. Historically, there's been more proactive reductions for single family residences. Will your office consider and act on detailed info to support reductions for suffering hotel and retail um, in advance of the 21 enrollment? Um, yeah, it's a great question. And I think the answer is potentially. And so I think the question is whether we're able to gather enough information and market data to be able to justify that decrease for commercial properties. Um, I think probably um, many of you who are especially are in the market, you, you are aware that it doesn't look like single family homes necessarily are seeing a reduction in prices as a result of the pandemic as of the lean date. So the lean date is January 1, 2021. Um, we have, however, seen a bit of a softening in the condo market, so we're taking a look at that to see whether or not um, recent sales might be eligible for reductions based on the comparison. So remember, the way that Prop 8s work is that we would be taking a look at the market value for that particular property and comparing it to that particular property's Prop 13 value, and whichever is lower is what we would enroll. So even if you saw like an overall softening of the condo market, but you bought your condo 10 years ago, 
you might your condo might have dropped in value, but it didn't drop below your Prop 13 protected base year value, so you wouldn't see a reduction. So we do have to take a look at kind of market conditions and compare it to individual properties, Prop 13 value. The question was speaking specifically to commercial properties, hotels, office buildings, and so on. I think right. one of the things that we're looking at right now as an office is to say, what kind of data have we seen? What kind of market sales have we actually seen pass through our office? And is that actually showing us that there is a um, big reduction that is that is warranted? So we are taking a look at that right now. Our office is also readying right now a informal survey to send out to some of the commercial properties as well to kind of say, you know, we understand that this is a difficult time and that it might be very hard for you to provide information to us, but this is voluntary. If you'd like to share some more recent kind of market information with us, share it with us so we can see whether or not there's a case to be made to reduce uh, property values proactively. Great, and, great. and then I think, and I think of course, um, Ultimately, the decision, because of the date that I will be out of this office and into the new one, ultimately, it will actually be the new assessor's call on whether that proactive reduction happens um, because the, we submit the role in June. And so we have until that period of time to say, should we, should we not? What does the market tell us in terms of values as of January 1? Okay, great, great. Um... Here's another clarifying question for seniors um, regarding someone who sells and buys and would like to transfer their property tax assessment. Um, the writer understands if uh, you buy at or below the sales price and meet the regulations, it should be pretty straightforward. The question is, what if their purchase price is greater than the sales price? I heard that the difference no longer has Prop 13 protection and may increase greater than 2% per year. So uh, I don't understand the question with um, purchase price being higher than the sales price. Yeah, I'm a little confused on that one too. Yeah. So, but, but let me, I think what I think what this person might be getting at is this question. In the current law, the way that it works is that when you buy a replacement property, the market value of your replacement home has to be equal to or less than the market value of the home that you live in currently. So you're the, the one that you've, you have replaced, right? So the right. old home versus your replacement home. Under Prop 19, however, there is no, that requirement is no longer the case. There, that doesn't exist. So any property can qualify for this, for at least a partial reduction. So what that would mean is like, if my old replacement home if the home that I, I'm leaving is one, worth $1 million in the marketplace, under the existing law, I'd have to buy a replacement home that was worth $1 million in the marketplace or 900000 something lower, in order for us to get that benefit. It was a kind of an all or nothing deal right now. So the way that it works in the future is that my home that I'm leaving is worth $1 million in the marketplace, but I can also buy a $2 million home as a replacement. What would happen is that I would take the $1 million and compare it to that $2 million. The difference there is 1 million. So I would add that million dollar difference to the taxable value of that million dollar home. So even though the market value of the home I'm leaving is $1 million, maybe I was being taxed at 200,000 for that home, right? Right. So in that case, for that replacement home, in my example, I would add that million dollars to the 200,000. So instead of being taxed as a senior at that full $2 million level, I would be taxed at $1.2 million. So that's the way that benefit would work. So now there's no kind of a, you have to meet the criteria of it being equal or lesser value. That goes away, and but there is an adjustment if it is worth more. Makes sense. Okay. Um, so we're going to, we, we've got one more question for you. I know you have a, a, or maybe two more if we have time. I know you've got a hard cutoff. So um Here's another question. A husband and wife both live at the property. The husband is uh, over 55, not on title, and the wife is under 55 years of age, owns the pro property as sole and separate property. Can mm -hmm. they still use this law to move the property tax? You know, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, so let me get back to that person on it. Okay, and and one, one more question. Um, uh, here's a question about how to work with the assessor's office during COVID. How does a property owner send corrections to the tax record so the public database is accurate, for example, the square footage or number of baths or bedrooms? Mm, 
Mm, yeah, we do. We do have that sometimes. So our um, existing property tax system, you know, was put in place in the 1980s or so. One of the things it does not have, which we're trying to correct with the new system, is um, kind of safeguards. You know, so for every kind of um, entry we put, there should always be basic information that we put in there, such as square footage or number of bathrooms or those kinds of that, that kind of information. Our current system doesn't have those safeguards. So you can completely leave square footage entirely blank sometimes on property records. And that's not a good thing for the office because it's hard to be able to compare all of those for a whole host of reasons. So we're trying to correct that with a new system. But that being said, for individuals right now who say, I'm taking a look at my formal records, it looks like something's off. I, uh, the square footage, it should be 1400 square feet, but it says 1200. So how do I fix that? The best thing to do is to, of course, share with us the information that you have that proves that that is true. So for example, many people might have a 3R report or something that, that proves that they have kind of permitted 1400 square foot. And they're saying, you know, the 3R report says this and we've in fact done this and can confirm this, but your record is incorrect. In that case, we would essentially take a look at that data, that information and correct it on our end if, if it makes sense to. Okay, and they can just, email that information or I mean those requests or yeah they can okay. so any any which way that you come into our office so there's that assessor portal so um a, or or the email that I shared which is yeah. assessor at sfgov.org you mm -hmm. can send it there it goes to our public service um uh, folks but they will route it to real property or to standards or to whatever division it needs to go to for for resolution great um, and, and just before you leave, one last question, and then we'll let you go. Yeah. Um, if a property owner, um, their non-primary residence, um, dies before February 16th, can children still use assessment exclusion of Prop 58 after February 16th? Yeah, good question. So um, when you see a transfer of ownership, Often transfers of ownerships, they don't always happen the same way. Some people do it because they, they have sold a property and they would record a new deed to reflect that. So like a grant deed, right? Some people transfer ownership perhaps by submitting something like a quick claim where their share goes away and they kind of give it to someone else. Other people might have, have set up like, let's just say a, a trust where they say, when I pass away, my property should go to my child or to whoever they desire. And so in that situation, the effective date of that transfer is when that person died, right? Because there was an instrument in place that automatically sent it to someone else or gave it to someone else, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, so the example that this individual is sharing is a situation where I'm assuming that the, the person who passed away had actually, or is, you know, may pass away, um, had actually set up an instrument that basically tells people what their wishes were. So it doesn't have to go through like a probate process and so on. And in that situation, we would be taking a look at the effective date, which is the death date, the date of death, when that transfer would happen. And we would apply the law as of that time. But remember, you do have to submit, you have to proactively submit to us the parent to child exclusion. So that Prop 58 form, you do have to submit that to us to say, hey, by the way, I, I have a, an existing relationship as a child to this individual who passed away. I qualify for the exclusion and I confirm that all of this information is true, et cetera. So just know that there, there are multiple ways in which we take a look at when the effective date of a transfer is. In that case, it sounds like a person may have passed away before the effective date of February 16th, um, but you would still have to submit the application, the Prop 58 application in order to get the benefit. Great, great. Well, Assessor Chu, thank you so, so much for being with us today. Um, really, it's been, it's always a pleasure to see you, but if, especially since we haven't seen each other in so long, it's great to see you. So, yeah. And I just want to personally wish you so much good luck um, in your new role, which I'm sure you will, you will be confirmed and, and move into, um, fingers crossed. Um, and you've done amazing, amazing work for us as San Franciscans, um, and we're very, very grateful. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, I look forward to continuing to work with you. I'm sure there will be opportunities to partner. And if I can ever be of help, even in my new role, please never hesitate to reach out. Yeah, we, we, we will be sure to be in touch in the future. So. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Have Happy New Year, everybody. Yeah. Please yeah. stay safe.
Thank you. And, and again, thank you to Assessor Chu's staff um, for all the help that they gave just setting everything up and also um, helping us answer questions in the Q&A. Um, I also noticed that uh, Assessor Chu's email or the Assessor's Office email is in the chat window. So you guys can um, use that. And um, again, thank you to Genevieve. Um, for uh, arranging all of this as well and all the work that she does behind the scenes for all of the events that we do here at SFAR. Um, Nicole, Annie, and Vivian, thank you so much. Genevieve, thank you so much. Everybody have a great weekend. I know this is a lot of information. Again, this recording will be available as well as the slide deck and Genevieve will get information out about that when it is. So have a great weekend, everybody.